Hello, my name is Erin Palmer, and I will be talking to you today about handling big data at Spotify. A little bit about me. I am a senior data engineer in the personalization mission here in New York City. I've been at Spotify for about three and a half years. I have been working on a variety of problems and different teams in my time at Spotify. So today, I will talk to you about some of the interesting problems that I have tackled in my time here. So the outline of this talk is first we'll talk through a sampling of some of the big data problems that we as data engineers at Spotify we encounter on a daily basis. And then I will walk you in depth through two different case studies. One being a feature computation pipeline that I wrote uh, and the other one being the wrapped 2018 data pipelines. So data processing examples. The very first one I will talk about is Discover Weekly. If you've used Spotify, you have probably heard of Discover Weekly. Discover Weekly is a playlist that comes out every Monday that gives you a sampling of music that you have not previously listened to. So for instance here, this is a playlist that a user might get. The challenge with Discover Weekly is every user has a different user representation. A user is represented as a vector in a vector space. And what we try to do is we try to find from the whole catalog of music, we try to find tracks that we think a user will like in particular. How this is done is this, this uses a collaborative filtering algorithm and it looks at the other users' playlisting activity. So the unique challenge here in terms of the data pipeline is that we need to be able to process the whole catalog for every single user. On top of that, there's, a cha there's an additional challenge of we don't want to show you the music you've pre previously listened to. So uh, these two problems make this a very large problem computationally, as you can imagine, with uh, our very large user base and a very rich catalog. And I think in the end, uh, it does manage to produce a very good experience for, for most users. Another pipeline um, that I've worked on, actually one of my first pipelines as I came to Spotify was a Fan Insights pipeline. The Fan Insights pipeline is a data pipeline that shows to artists stats about their listeners all across the world and how well their music is performing. Some things that the artists might be interested in is things like, you know, which countries are their listeners from or uh, how well their music is performing in various playlists or how many monthly listeners they have across time. And that is actually one of the first pipelines that was written in Shio and fully on, uh, on top of the Google Cloud platform. And the challenging thing with uh, a lot of the artist stuff is most of the data pipelines you're summing something or counting something. In this case, we want to identify numbers of unique users. So the challenge here is finding the distinct sets from data. So what might a data pipeline look like? Here's one. This is the view that we have that Google provides for us uh, on top of Google Dataflow. So this is a pipeline written in Shio. And you can see here the complexity that you can bake into your Shio pipeline. There's a lot going in here. We don't need to go into details, but this just is meant to showcase how flexible you can build a pipeline. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is feature computation for ML model training. So this is actually uh, a pipeline that I've, I'm working on currently in the team that I'm on. Um, and the challenge there is we want to be able to build a model in order to be able to, um, to sequence correctly user playlists. And of course that requires a large amount of data, uh, track data as well as user data. So I will talk you th quickly through what this pipeline might look like, and then we'll look at some of the challenges. So first, in any feature engineering pipeline, you need to compute some features that may or may not be available to you. Uh, so for instance, here, you're looking at user and track features. The user, tr user features might be what's the, uh, average popularity of the track that the user looks at. 
what's the user's registration country. For a track, a feature might be what's the genre of the track, what's the duration. Then the next step is we need to actually get all the interactions for all the users and tracks. And for this, we need to look at the streaming history. So the interactions provide us information of what, what our objectives are, what the labels might be in the machine learning pipeline. We use, in this case, we use streams, uh, playlist ads, likes, etc. And lastly, we put all the features and interaction together, do some transforms, and uh, finally train our model. The challenge, there's a couple of different challenges here. Of course, as you can imagine, uh, building features, we want to be able to build it for the arbitrary sets of users, so that in itself, you know, barring sampling, it, it's, a, it's a large amount of data to process. We also may want to compute features for arbitrary date ranges. So for instance, what was the user doing in the past day or the past seven days or the past six months? So here is a view of the pipeline that just computes the user features. And it's actually a pretty simple pipeline, especially if we remember the previous pipeline that I showed you. In this case, we're computing user features from four different sources. And what this pipeline is doing is just basically doing a join. That's all it is. It's processing 2.5, uh, about 2.5 terabytes of data. It depends on day. Um, and so as far as the pipelines go, this is a pretty straightforward one. We use Shio for all of these pipelines. What are some benefits of using Shio over some other frameworks? So some of the benefits are, of course, that you can uh, read from a variety of Google Cloud products, such as uh, GCS. You can read from BigQuery. You can, uh, you can read from Bigtable, as well as writing. You can write to all of those different data sources. Another nice feature that um, Dataflow provides for us is the ability to auto-scale our pipeline. So in this case, you can see that when the pipeline was first started, it didn't need too many workers. And as the time went on, it was doing something more complex. So that's probably our join. And then at the end, once it was kind of finishing up, it downscaled itself. So auto-scaling is a huge benefit. And of course, if you see a more sophisticated pipeline, it, this auto-scaling algorithm will be wildly different. The other benefit is that you don't actually need to, so with a lot of frameworks like Hadoop, you generally tend to write your data out to disk in between the different steps. So with you, you don't need to do this. So here's an example of a pipeline. Um, that's actually the second step that I talked about previously. This is where you take user features and track features and interactions, and you put them all together to basically create examples for the machine learning model to train on. So you can see that it reads on two different sources, uh, does some other stuff, joins. So basically, you know, three series of joins. It does some filtering, some other stuff. So nowhere here do we actually output this to disk. It's a single pipeline. Okay, the next thing that I will talk about to you is another project that I worked on last year, uh, and this is the Wrapped campaign uh, that we run every year. So I, I was one of the engineers on the Wrapped 2018 project, um, and we built this system. This was the, f the first year that we actually built the whole experience for the users entirely on Shio. Um, this campaign typically shows users all of the data that, all of their streaming data from the last year to kind of show them what their favorite streams were, what their favorite artists, favorite tracks, et cetera. Of course, um, in the GDPR compliant way, uh, so we don't show users things that are not GDPR compliant, as well as uh, data only goes back a certain amount. So I will go here through, um, kind of the overall architecture of the system that we built last year um, at, at a high level. So you can imagine that each one of these boxes that I show in the pipeline flow is actually a single Shio job. So this kind of gives you a, a larger view in the system. So first we have the data source, which we'll talk about later. From there, we take uh, the, the raw data and we do some aggregations. Aggregations, um, uh, 
that we can just do based on the stream data, such as top artist, top playlist, the first stream that you had was one of the stories last year. Then we take some, maybe some additional data and we compute some jobs that require, that are kind of more computationally intensive. So this might be your first discovered artist of the year was one of these jobs that requires us looking further back and maybe consuming some other different data sources. Um, the top 100 playlist also is one of these. The next job is what we call data enrichment. In this case, we take all the data that we've already computed and grab from other data sources, and we add things like images and metadata, because we, and if you remember your wrapped experience from last year, and I'll show you some pictures, each, each of the views on the web page, it had a picture, as well as a play button of a track you could play. Finally, every year for Wrapped, you can only get a meaningful experience if you kind of streamed enough music throughout the year and there is precise requirements. So in this case, we have another pipeline that will then filter the data down to just the users who are eligible to receive the Wrapped experience. And that's just, we did this separately just to have a view on who got filtered out and why. And finally, we store all the data in Bigtable that can be then accessed by a service that was serving all the data to users. Okay, so here are some of the data stories that a user may have seen uh, in their last year's wrap. Uh, there are some interesting stories here. So for instance, one of the stories that you see on the, on the top where it says dance pop, that was your top micro genre for the year. So this, this required looking at all the st user streaming history and looking at the micro genres of all the tracks. The other one, the first story showed you the first artist that you discovered as well as the first song that you played that year. Um, again, looking at streaming history here. Then, of course, you have the number of minutes. We have that unwrapped every year. Uh, number of minutes that you stream Spotify for. There was a story last year that showed you uh, the horoscope of the artists that you tend to stream, uh, single act artists primarily, in case you're wondering. Um, then there, is another, there was another story about top podcasts, pretty self-explanatory. In case you're preparing for RAP 2019, by the way, you may wanna think through some of these stories to see how you might wanna adjust your streaming this year to get a better RAP experience. Um, then you have an oldest song of the year that you listen to, which is interesting. And then, of course, every year you get a charts. That's what we call um, the list of your top artists, top tracks, top genres for the year. And so here is just some illustrations of what that looked like. The big challenge here is all of the users who get this wrapped experience, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of streaming data. So at this point, this is not just big data. This is actually what we call extra large data. So how can we process this? Most standard uh, processing on the normal reasonable number of machines actually fails in case you try to dis just join all of this data from GCS sources or BigQuery. So how do we do this? Big table. Big table comes to rescue. Um, why is that? So the very costly and very expensive and very slow part of any data processing is actually shuffle stage. So how can we avoid using the shuffle in our data processing? So what we leverage is actually the way that the big table lays out the data on disk. So if you look here, this is an example of what the data pattern might look like. So you have the key, which is user one and user two in this case, and they have some data. So for three different dates, what you realize is that all of the data for a single user, since the uh, row keys are ordered lexicographically, all of the data for a single user is actually co-located. So what ends up happening when you when you read the data using a scan from Bigtable, you actually end up with all of the data for a single user and a single worker. 
And then all you have to do is actually in grouping just for that one user becomes really easy and really simple because you actually don't have to do the shuffle. So if we look here in our overall architecture of the wrapped pipelines, the raw data source was actually Bigtable. And the Bigtable contained all of the streaming data for the users for the year. And cool, that's it. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. <laughs>